Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Richard Dreyfus to Stand By Me, River Phoenix to Explorers, James Cromwell to The Green Mile, Jeffrey DeMunn to The Shawshank Redemption, Gail Bellows to Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, Javier Botet, It. We are never the same. Was he a dead body? I bet you anything that if we find him, we'll get our pictures in the paper. Yeah, yeah, we can even be on TV. Sure, we'll be heroes. Yeah. You're never gonna get out of this town now, my boy. You can do anything you want, man. I still say he cheated. Look, we both voted. And we both thought it was a good list. And besides, you got to pick the name of the next road. What do you got to complain about? It's, it's not that. It's the, the this algorithm thing. It's just, uh, I don't know. It just feels dirty. I'm not going to lie. That kind of tastes funny to me, too. But you know what? I look at it this way. It could be a good thing. I'm, you know, I know you and I have been having to headbutt a few walls to get things. I mean, the longer this podcast goes, it's just going to get harder to connect movies. You know, maybe a little, uh, a little uh, robot help wouldn't be such a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, you might be right. Besides, it is actually a fun list. Some good movies on it. So right, it's right. Not See, bad. it's not too bad. It could be yeah, worse. Sorry, I got, I got to do my podcast. Yes, I know. It's annoying. Friday night. Yes, yes, I miss date night too. But I got to do this thing. Yeah, yeah, it's not permanent. No, look, it's not going to be every Friday night for the foreseeable future. No. Yes, I'm working on my program. Yeah, hopefully I'll have it done by the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. It, yes, yes, it's going to completely replace it. Look, Tom is almost perfect. So, like, I got freaking Tom on the line, and he recorded a shit ton of lines for me. Dumbass didn't even realize I was doing it to uh, imitate his voice. Like, seriously. And you would think that compared to what he said in the script versus what I had him record, that he would clue in that I was doing something. No, no, he's totally oblivious. Yeah. yeah, I still gotta get Dan to record his lines. Yep. Oh no. Yeah, it was it was beautiful. I gotta let you listen to it. And like I said, it's getting there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Okay. Well, I gotta go now. I gotta get on this damn thing. God, I know it's annoying, but I'll manage. Okay. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm doing intro tonight, right? Uh. Hello, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit Podcast. I'm Josh, British name Reginald, and uh, the Fire Pit, you know, we're moving along. Great. Now it's time to take the kids out on a fun field trip. Well, it might not be fun for them, but it'll be fun for us. But we've traveled the road to Independence Day. We swam the waters to Jaws, and now we get to pack our bags, and we're heading on a field trip to Kingtown. Yes, indeed. We are on a new path to it. Yes, Josh, but where? No, Dan, not now. <laughs> so the movie, It, Chapter One, the 2017 movie based off of the novel by Stephen King, that's where we're going on our field trip to Kingtown. But we have to hit our very first stop on this trip. And as per the rules, we have taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved him to this film. So to tell us about what we're watching... I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Thompson. Well, thank you, Josh. Hello, everyone. I'm 
Tom, British name Thompson. And last week we watched Robert Shaw get eaten alive by a shark, uh, real in the movie, and real life by the machine in Jaws, which honestly is something we all wanted to see happen to his character in Splash Buckler the week before. Watch that episode. Trust us. But... If you closed your eyes, listened very carefully to the movie last week, you would have heard the smooth voice of Richard Dreyfus, which is exactly what we'll be hearing tonight as Richard Dreyfus provides narration in tonight's film. So we'll be listening to it. What? The movie? Stop that. <laughs> now, we're going to get to listen for Richard Dreyfus in this coming of age classic, Stand By Me. And to give us a rundown, a little bit of trivia and facts, I now turn the spotlight to Nigel. Evening, friends. I'm Nigel, American name Dan. And uh, just as Tom said, we are watching the often parodied, often imitated, but never quite been duplicated Stand By Me, the first Stephen King movie on our field trip to Kingtown. Stand By Me is directed by Rob Reiner, meathead on All in the Family for all of those paying attention out there. The release date was August 8th, 1986 for limited release. The second release was August 22nd, 1986. So we're actually one day away from the anniversary of the movie. It had a budget of $8 million and a box office return of $52.3 million. So it made its money back. Now, yeah, that's 1986 dollars. So it's some good money. It has a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes and an IMDb score of 8 out of 10. It is another movie based on a book or... Wait, a book? <laughs> this is another movie based on a book or literary characters however the title was changed the stephen king book is called the body the producers were afraid during production that the movie would sound either like a porn movie or an adult murder mystery and since they did actually want younger teenager fans to see the movie they needed to change the name so the name was changed uh, halfway through production to stand by me it's one of the few stephen king adaptations that the author is actually happy with he is notoriously overly critical of movie adaptations of his films he is not usually the biggest fan of them. famously he actually hates the kubrick v version of the shining considered one of the best movies of all time by most critics but stephen king viscerally hates that film the movie takes place in the 50s another uh, and it had a robust soundtrack that uh, renewed interest in many of the songs of the movies, similar to how two Guardians of the Galaxy movies used songs from the 70s and the early 80s, and they got popular and rediscovered again. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like that little parallel. The movie's considered a landmark film. It's not necessarily in special effects or movie making or camera work or anything like that, but in storytelling. It's one of the first movies to show that young boys have feelings, growing pains, difficult steps to adulthood, and can cry so it, like i said it's definitely a landmark kind of film in that kind of storytelling but that's most of what i have because i'm not going to read all this that tom copied and pasted in last night <laughs> we're going to be here all night although i will say a couple of these random facts I, I did actually enjoy one or two of these random facts i did read also that Corey feldman was uh, felt like this was the character he's played in his career that he was the closest to which is an outright lie by Corey Feldman because he's obviously Donatello. So, <laughs> what's the movie about again, anyways? What Ninja Turtles? It's about no. four... <laughs> yeah, four teenage mutant ninja brothers. Come on, we watched the first. It was the first episode of the podcast, Tom. God, I'm done. No, the the movie is. Um, it's been a while since I've actually seen this film. I mean, a while, but I think the movie is about. One of them thinks that there's a body or they, they found out somebody was killed and they were looking for a body and they wanted to go see it. So they set off to go and try to find this body. And over the course of the uh, journey, they have some run ins with some bullies. They have some conversations about how different their childhoods are from each other. And I, I know I'm missing some beats in the story. Again, I haven't seen this movie in a while. I don't think I've ever seen it. My only knowledge with it is like, do you want to go see a dead body? And then that's the entire plot device to start the movie. An odd sort of MacGuffin to, for a coming-of-age childhood nostalgia film. Well, but it still does sound like something that boys would do, especially in the 80s before there was, you know, cell phones and video games and mm -hmm. and uh, all this other stuff. It definitely sounds like, so, hey, you want to go see a body? Like, absolutely, I would have been on board with that. Yeah, well, <laughs> what's you a bunch of 12-year-olds in the 80s going to do? Yeah. This film yeah. takes place in the 50s, even, so... I mean, and we, it wasn't even a real human body. I still remember growing up and somebody found a dead possum in a field behind the house. And we were like, we had to go see it, you know? So it's like, shit. Um, the things we uh, did before the internet. Kids these days have no idea how boring it got before there was <laughs> Netflix. And I ground my kids from the TV for four hours, and it's like I ended their lives. They're all talking to their room like, 
Want to go find a dead body? Then they start uh, poking me with a stick. I don't get that. <laughs> anyway, so I, so I didn't mean to derail you. Yeah, kids these days have no idea how, how boring life was before there was cat memes on Reddit and their TikTok and whatever else it is the kids are into these days. Now get um, off my lawn. Yeah, get off my lawn and go find a dead body. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wow, whose birthday is it today? Because you two are sounding like the old guys. But no, I'm just like I said, uh, I know I'm missing some story beats, but uh, I think... I'm kind of looking forward to watching it again. It's considered one of the best movies ever. And it's actually considered Rob Reiner's magnum opus. Like it's, mm. it's considered the best movie he's ever done. Which is actually saying quite a bit. He's had some pretty good films. I yeah. Mean, it's Princess like it's Bride. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Princess Bride, which I consider his magnum opus, not this, but like, who am I to judge? And it, it does have a really high percentage on Rotten Tomatoes. It's got a pretty good high percentage on IMDb. And even the author himself liked it. In fact, apparently according to some, he was shaking when he saw the premiere of this movie because he was enjoying the movie so much, whereas mm -hmm. he's, he's been notoriously overly critical of his works. Stephen King is surprisingly more of a fan when his books get turned into TV movies because they usually use the miniseries format <laughs> as opposed to uh, straight up books. That's uh, another thing in this movie's favor. This was based on a short story, so there was less they had to try to stretch out or condense. I've mm -hmm. actually read yeah. The Body. It's in its like, collection of four short stories along with, uh, incidentally, uh, one of the other films down this line, Shawshank Redemption, and one film that isn't going to be on here, I believe it was Apt Pupil, which we'll need to find sometime because that's a dark story. So it's yeah, that's easier to get. Right? I think so. No, you're Brad fine. Renfro you're fine. And, uh, Ian McKellum. Yeah, that was yes. a fantastic movie. Dude, I have Dude, yet to yeah. see the movie, but whew, if this half is, uh, I mean, come on. Dude finds out his neighbor's a Nazi. It's like, let's be friends. <laughs> That's, oh, Stephen. Oh, boy. 80 Stephen King was dark. Yeah, his his movies, since this is the, the first of the movies in the field trip to Kingtown, and it's the first Stephen King movie we've done in the podcast. Um, I'm going to say that uh, his books that have been adapted into movies have been met with varying degrees of success. Some are loved, like The Shining, like this movie, and some are hated, like Dark Tower. And uh, I'm trying to think of another king movie that's not very well liked oh you could throw a grenade and hit like 50 of those yeah. just off the top of my head the lawnmower man yeah um, yeah lawnmower man um there's a tv exactly. movie version of the shining which is considered awful but however stephen king loves it and considers it closer to his um the remake of carrie the first carrie was great the remake of carrie is pretty awful dr sleep was just recently in theaters it bombed of course that was right at the beginning of the whole covid thing wasn't it or yeah was so i don't know if, i don't i haven't seen it so i'm not going to judge the movie itself but i just it, it bombed children of the corn i think didn't oh, they make yeah. like 14 sequels to that movie children of the corn like part 27 yeah there's been like 100 children of the corn movies uh Maximum Overdrive. I remember that oh. was, that was, that was <laughs> Oh god, so, yeah. Oh god, that was classic 80s though. Yeah, currently holding a 17% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, I'll be honest, I have not seen all of the movies based on his works and maybe it's because it does they don't always interest me. But his movies they're polarizing. Well, they're not his movies. He hasn't directed any of his own books, but they're movies based on his works. And they always must always get labeled Stephen King movies, even though they've been directed by a wide variety of directors. Like, yeah, it's like one of those things. It's a draw. Like if you put his name on the title, it's like, oh, it's Stephen King. I like Stephen King. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and my dad's a big Stephen King fan. I, I hear the fanboy from him. It's like they made another Stephen King adaptation. It's going to suck like all the others. Mm -hmm. And most of the time he's right. Although it is interesting. Um, stand by me. It Shawshank Redemption, all connected universe. Yeah, and did they come out with a show, a TV show that had them all linked recently? I know, I know, I can't think of the name of the show, but like they reference Dolores Claiborne, they reference Shawshank Prison, they reference Derry, uh, Castle Rock. Thank you, that's the one. Yeah, which is where I think this film takes place. Nice. Yeah, it's all connected because Dark Tower is kind of like the nexus and all the evil dark magic from that universe mm -hmm. bleeds into like all that things. Well, Again, it doesn't bleed into everything. According to Stephen King, it all bleeds into Maine. Maine is the most dangerous place on Earth. If Stephen King crossed over with the Buffy universe, Maine absolutely would be the Hellmouth. Yeah. <laughs> Almost all of Stephen King's works take place somewhere in Maine, usually Upper Maine, and a lot of his characters share many traits with King. They're Maine and the Stephen King universe is like the hospital in Grey's Anatomy. They're both yeah, terrible. They're both terrible. Although I think less people die in Maine in the Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, I'm just saying his works have been polarizing. I'm looking forward to seeing this though. I'm looking forward to this list. Uh, like I said, the field trip to Kingtown because we've got multiple Stephen King movies on this list, and then we've even got a couple of movies on this list that, while they're not King movies, they're kind of inspired by him, mm-hmm. um, or they at least share a lot of the same traits that he put. Yeah. Yeah. King's got no problem putting kids in danger in any of his works. Yeah, like, that's honestly one thing I absolutely love. Like the, it, one thing that really grasped me on it is the fact that it's like these kids are in peril. I haven't seen either movie yet, but I was reading that some of the critic reviews of it chapter two was one of the reasons why they didn't think the stakes were so high is because they were adults now and not kids and the kids make the stakes even oh yeah larger because kids are not as strong as adults kids are not as brave as adults kids are not as crafty as adults they're not as smart they're not as smart as adults despite what tgif friday sitcoms would have shown you that's why it chapter one was they a lot of people thought it was a better movie because the kids were the ones in the danger and the Mm -hmm. kids were the ones confronting pennywise not the adult mm-hmm. and plus the actors they had for it but it's like in this film were just really top notch i mean yeah. for being in so few things they they were amazing and the parallels between it that we're going to watch in a few weeks in this one just too because i was glancing over the imdb stuff with the exception of Corey feldman Almost all of these kids, this was like their second or maybe first roles. Will Wheaton was a voice in uh, Secret of Nim and in Last Starfighter. Jerry Connell, this this is his first role. River Phoenix, he had some after-school specials, but that was really about it. Also, he was in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, the TV series, or as I like to call it, the Better Dating Through Stockholm Syndrome show. <laughs> <laughs> it's But it's amazing. I think it's the level of talent that the casting directors saw in these kids both here and it that also elevated it it's amazing what a kid who knows how to act can make a film not suck yeah i can't get my kids to empty the dishwasher let alone act a scene i couldn't imagine what this director must have had to go through must have been like rod reiner they said rod reiner did some pretty dickish things to some of the kids to get reactions out of them oh yeah yeah uh they were being chased by a train in one scene it's like okay if you kids don't make it seem like it's scary i will throw you off of this bridge yeah like rob reiner got into their face and just screamed and hollered at them and then they got them to actually like cry and blubber and look like it was really scary and then after they got the final cut of the scene rob reiner like literally apologized to him and took him out for ice cream he was he was a very much an abusive father he's like smacking him around and then just takes him out to ice cream to make up for it later the things you could get away with before the internet and twitter yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my god yeah can you imagine what that would be like in today's age it is kind of interesting seeing this young cast and seeing the careers that followed i mean Kiefer sutherland uh river phoenix probably would have been what johnny depp ended up becoming if he hadn't died mm, yeah but um cory feldman had a pretty solid career obviously we know will wheaton from star trek the next generation jerry o'connell's had a really good career in fact and that's two ties to star trek because jerry o'connell's in the current star trek show uh, damn it you stole some of the notes i was going to say for after the movie damn it <laughs> <laughs> so just so just so the trivia quit or the um yeah the trivia and the other stuff doesn't overrun the actual length of the movie which is only 89 minutes um i'm gonna go ahead and segue into the expectations um so i will start with josh since this is your list and we're going with it well what are you looking forward to out of this film all honesty i okay i talked to my parents about this like i told them i have never seen it but they told me uh yeah you've seen this you just don't remember you've seen this with such <laughs> confidence that I was a little like, what else do you know about me? I don't think I've ever seen this movie. They're fairly confident that I have. So I, I don't know what to expect. I know one thing about this movie is that Rick and Morty parodied it. Oh, and yeah. That they are uh, going to see a dead guy. And I vaguely remember a scene where they're running away from the train over a bridge. Beyond that, yeah, that's it. That's all I got. So my expectations are... I'm not going to say low because I've heard great things about this movie. And obviously it wouldn't be such in the zeitgeist unless it was a good movie. Cause you know, like swashbuckler was new to all of us and that 
film was garbage. So there was a reason we none of us had heard about it. Whereas this one, I knew about this movie and I was really looking forward to getting it when I was building my list. And I was like, I hope we get picked this list because I really want to see this movie. So I'm looking forward to it tonight. Yeah, right. I, I know I had it on mine. Um, for the same reason that you took it from Jaws, I had it leading into Jaws is that Richard Dreyfuss is the voice in this movie. Um, I think he plays the older version of Will Wheaton's character. And uh, it's funny that um, we now know that Will Wheaton does not grow into looking like Richard Dreyfuss. So. <laughs> Or the guy who played the old version of Will Wheaton in Star Trek The Next Generation. Yeah, he doesn't grow into that at all. He looks exactly nothing like him. (laughs) What do you got, Tom? Well, I think I'm the only one here that's both read the story and seen the movie. I saw this on VHS when I was, well, roughly about all the kids' age in this. I was around 12-ish, going about into junior high. I love the film. I didn't really connect with the characters too much, except for Will Wheaton's character, because odd man out, kind of the nerdy guy. Kind of related to him a little bit more. I remember loving it. I remember the notes that needed to hit, hit. The connections that connected, connected. Now that I'm an adult and understand nostalgia, I understand looking back with a little more of a rose-colored vision... I think I'm going to get a little more out of that. It's, it's ironic that we are watching this on my birthday, or I guess coincidental. I'm closer to Richard Dreyfus's character's age now than I am the kid's age. So I'm watching it with that. Just in case God, you didn't I'm... gather that, happy birthday there, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I'm old. But I'm looking forward to seeing it. And with a little more respect, especially considering this was Rob Reiner's third film. The first two were The Sure Thing, which was a John Cusack film, and This is Spinal Tap. So he went from those two to what is arguably one of the benchmarks for coming-of-age movies. Not bad, Rob. Or excuse me, Carl Reiner, not Rob Reiner. Goddamn. Completely different people. Not even remotely the same person. No. So we've been fucking that up this whole time? No, it's, I've, I've been saying Rob Reiner. That's who directed it's, the movie. Or, Carl Reiner directed this movie. Oh, Rob geez. Reiner. I'll edit <laughs> all of that out. Edit all of that out. <laughs> that's, that's the podcast so far. Carl Meathead. Reiner. Meathead. Meathead, yes. Meathead from All in the Family. No, it's directed by Rob Reiner. I'm on IMDb right now. Oh, so Don't, I knew I was right. <laughs> and why so did I, like, I put down Carl Reiner? Oh, God, God damn it, Tom. It. Oh, Jesus. Tom's got to Now we're definitely editing. leaving that in. Now we're definitely like, leaving we, it we would, in. We would make sure we'd, we'd have it edited if me or Dan was making a mistake. But since Tom made the mistake, it's staying in. All right. Well, can I get my damn <laughs> expectations now? Or are we just going to... Yeah, go for it there, Daniel. <laughs> Nigel, I meant to say, go for it there, Nigel. Oh, well. God, we do need to be replaced by robots. We might be. It might be time for us to hang this up, guys. Yeah, real quick, real quick. Could you repeat that last thing you just said? Tom, I need you to be quiet and say it directly into the mic and make sure you enunciate it. No, no, we're not falling for this. Don't fall for it, Nigel. Don't. 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 Don't listen to Tom. Come on. So Uh, your expectations, Nigel. I, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what this movie is all about. I haven't seen it so long that I've actually forgotten most of the beats of the movie. And I know it's this coming of age story and it's this good movie about boys growing up. There's one line in the movie that I have heard quoted many times. that always rings for me when it says, I never had the same friends in life that I had when I was 12. Or something to that effect. I don't know if they're 12 in the movie or whatever, but the, Richard Drivers says it towards the end of the movie. And that is so true. That is so true. Now, present company excluded, I don't have the same friends that I had when I was 12 or 13. Dan, for the last time, we weren't friends in grade school. I lived in Kansas. And for the last time, I have rewrote our continuity. I'll allow it. <laughs> uh, it just, I, I'm, I'm think about that line in this movie a lot about how your friends come and go in your life but for some reason you do think about those friends that you had when you were younger that you don't have anymore and you've actually lost touch with them and i i have a few of those like i said present company excluded that i remember thinking to myself like man there wasn't a day that went by that i didn't hang out with that person or go play with them or go try to find a dead body i don't know we did a lot of crazy <laughs> we did a lot of crazy stuff in the mid 90s uh i don't hang out i'm not even friends on facebook with them so it's kind of weird but that's that's I think that's what I'm looking forward to the most. Just kind of seeing how nostalgia works when you're now old enough to understand what it is. Whereas when I first saw this movie, I was much, 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 much younger and didn't really understand nostalgia. So yeah, yeah, those were simpler times. Yes, they were. And I I, I think about that too. Like the the current the show on Netflix, Stranger Things, kind of has me thinking yeah. about that. Like 
the plot of the TV show aside, I know that they're getting involved in supernatural stuff that didn't actually happen to me when I was a kid, but because I'm not horribly traumatized as an adult as a result. You don't but, remember? You don't <laughs> remember us? He's in the, blocked uh, it out. He's blocked it out. Josh was there. He could tell you. Oh, yeah, that's right. Josh was, that's where we met Josh was in the Upside Down. I mean, I remember you just had that thousand yard stare. I mean, you literally had the guts of that kid in your hands. And you were screaming and crying. And you don't remember that? God. Oh, God, Johnny. No. I've still there got pictures. Four of us. <laughs> Those are good times. Johnny, no. No, I'm just saying that they, they ride their bikes all over town. They get into all this mischief. They get into all this stuff. And they, there's not an adult anywhere in sight. And I think people don't understand that. That's just how things were in the 80s and 90s. You just you went all over town or you went all over the area and you didn't think about anything like that now most parents aren't they don't let their kids go 10 feet in front of the house without falling well, that would... they're okay so now that i'm old enough to understand nostalgia like tom said i'm looking forward to seeing this movie because even though i didn't have my formative years in the mid 80s i had my formative years in the mid 90s i still remember getting into stuff with my friends riding our bikes all over town looking for dead bodies and <laughs> dealing with bullies and all this other stuff yeah the 90s were a magical time. Dead bodies everywhere. It looked like that scene in Gone with the Wind. They're all the just the, the Union and Confederate soldiers just everywhere. Because <laughs> the Civil War happened in the 90s too, right? Yes, of course it did. It did. It's, it's canon now. Speaking of canon and all things that are facts, does anyone have any quizzing for us? That I do, but I do have one thing before we make this segue good. I, I, <laughs> I would like to point out that we hit a milestone on the Fire Pit podcast this week, guys. Did we? Uh, yes, we did. We had our 100th download. Now, keep in mind, probably about 10% of that was me. But we did <laughs> hit our 100th download. So uh, I would like to give a special shout out this week to a friend of mine from the olden days of when I used to play a, a mobile Star Wars game. Brad Boys, thank you for uh, listening to the podcast. I know you mentioned you were very tired when you were listening to it. But uh, <laughs> shout out to our 100th listener. Woohoo! Yay, and, uh, Gabe Brad Boys. So th thank you. Thank you. And we do have a Discord set up now. So I wanted to get this early on in the podcast because I don't know how many people actually stay for the end. <laughs> but uh, we do have a Discord server now. So if you would like to get on and chat with us and tell us how many ways we're wrong in our episodes, please go to firepit.podbean.com. And on the left hand side of the page, we got a Discord invite. Hit us up and uh, we may shout out to you later on in the uh, future. Very nice. Hook them in, Josh. That's right. Yeah. Dangle that bait and fish them in. Come join us. Come join the us. Light, if you yeah, the deadlights. The deadlights. <laughs> nice. It's canon. It's canon. <laughs> but yes, continuing on that segue before I kill myself yes, on this segue, I do have some trivia for you guys tonight. <laughs> Yay, trivia. All right, so I actually have a slight script here that I, had, I wrote up because it's semi-relevant. But uh, it is often said that people will decide whether or not they're going to read a book based off of the first line. So this week's trivia, I'm going to take that concept and ruin it thoroughly. So I've got five reviews here, and I will be sharing the first line of their review. And based on that, I want you guys to guess the rating that they gave it. All right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So question number one it is a review by Martin Heffer. 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 I don't know. It's don't one word. That, so. Okay. You don't know this guy. Don't be yeah. mean. Don't be mean. No, I'm saying I don't know the name. I'm trying to pronounce it. It's H-A-F-E-R. Heifer or Heifer? Oh, shut up. <laughs> so the first line of his review is, currently, Stand By Me is rated 180 on IMDb. A very, very impressive score that would indicate that this is a great film. Um, you know, I guess my delivery could also really affect how the two guys are perceived. Like, I'm, currently, I'm going to go M. Night Shyamalan and say that there's a twist and that he actually hated this movie. Going to have to agree with Nigel on this one. Nigel, where do you think this falls on the 1 to 10? I'm going to say a uh, 4. I'm going to say a 3. And Nigel got it closest. It is a 6 out of 10 rating. Oof. Wow, that's better than I thought. So what's the rest of the sentence say? Well, that was the first sentence. The second line, I only saved the second line in the title. The title of his review was, I don't get the hype. And the second line was, however, try as I might, I have no idea why the film is rated highly. And I thought the movie was just average to above average and no more. I thought it was going to go way worse than that. All right. So question number two by Cinefreak Dude. His first line of his review was, Stand By Me is a film that I consider incredibly overrated. Uh, I'm going to say 5 out of 10. I'm going to say 7. <laughs> Nigel got it again. That was actually a 2 out of 10 rating. God damn it. Yeah. 
The title of this one was Overrated, Pretentious, and Annoying. Now, see, if you'd led with the title, maybe I would have got it. Do you guys do the titles? I wanted to add my little personal twist to it. No, no, no. We each bring a little different flavor to the quiz section. I, I apparently, I, I'm not very good when you do the quiz section. <laughs> His second line was, I like quite a few of Rob Reiner's films, Spinal Tap and Princess Bride in particular. So really, none of those gave away anything. Not really. Yeah. So, question three by uh, Thomas the Bloodhound. All one word. Ooh. Stand By Me is probably the best film ever to come from a Stephen King story. And this is in parentheses, but I'm going to include it in the statement. The Green Mile sucks, by the way. Immediately disqualified. He. This has got to be a one. Yeah, this is a two or a three. This is a, I'm going to say three. So what was yours, Tom? Uh, you know what? Actually, now I'm thinking about it. It's way too nice to be a one. No way. I'm going to stick with my answer. It's a one. So I'm going to read it again. Stand By Me is probably the best film to come from a Stephen King story. The Green Mile sucks, by the way. Okay? Yeah, but oh. it's still that snide, like, underhanded. You know, actually, no, I'm going to amend it. I'm going to say it's a eight. Oh, on the head. He rated it an eight out of ten. I got the save. Boom. Ha <laughs> ha. Num- question number four. Is, is my particular favorite first line? By solid abs, all lowercase, one word. Are people high? Is that a question that he asked? Or a no, it's are people high, period. It's not a question. He just said a statement. Are people high? I don't know what he's going for. It is are people high as a statement. There's no question mark. I'm going to say three out of ten, and he probably listed Independence Day 2 as a nine. I didn't do a lot of research on the actual reviewers, <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and say yes, he did. This feels like a four. I'm going to say this is a four. It was a one out of ten. Oh, wowzers. He he had a very eloquently and well-written review. The yeah, rest of it was, this is the most boring movie I've ever seen. Kept waiting for it to get better. It never did. What a waste of my life. That was the entire review. I can guarantee this asshole loved Independence Day 2. <laughs> I promise you he thought that movie was awesome. Yeah, the fact that he po- he was so well said in that statement kind of threw me off. That didn't sound like a, a one- I saw that one. I'm like, yep, got to have it. All right, folks, so question number five by Argyle Trout. This movie was like that baseball girl who got thrown out at home. What? Uh... <laughs> Josh, do you remember years ago when we went to go see Neil deGrasse Tyson? Yeah. That guy asked that stupid question about what is the speed of dark? Oh, and my... Neil deGrasse Tyson gave one of the best burns I've ever heard, which is yep. just because you know how to put words in a sequence doesn't mean you know how to actually make a sentence. That's this review. Just because you know words doesn't mean you know how to make a sentence. <laughs> so I'm going to say three out of 10. I'm going to say two out of 10. Amazingly enough, this was a nine out of 10 rating. My what? God. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. His All second right. line was, this is going to hurt to say this, but I feel like it needs to be aired. Except there aren't any girls in it, except for maybe this waitress who looks like Big Bird and thinks a gun and a cherry bomb are the same thing. How is the one star review guy more eloquent than the nine star review guy well i didn't select these reviews based off of their uh handle on the english language clearly not <laughs> oh wow the internet is dumb <laughs> nigel kings to you again i, I don't know I'm... what i won but i think i want to give it back <laughs> can, I, can i just accept it all on a gift certificate <laughs> i'm sorry we can only give that for in-store credit racist <laughs> <laughs> but on that note gentlemen shall we uh hop on their bikes and ride let's go look for a dead body guys tom no, Reginald. play the music ding 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 that, that's the sound of me ringing the bike bell as we ride off i know we're all cringing because of it <laughs> Welcome back to yet another coming of age episode of the Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and blast from the past, Tom. And remember those things that happened that we did with the people and the stuff that we did them with? Man, those were good times. Good times. And speaking of good times, we're starting off this time right with our first film in the field trip to Kingtown, Stand By Me. Starting off following kids to a corpse, which will eventually take us to a clown that turns kids into corpses. It's all coming around. 
Uh, thank you for joining us. And again, find us at firepit.podbean.com, uh, hosted on Podbean, fantastic podcast hosting site, home to such podcasts as Critical Role and us. So we want to thank them for their time and giving us time. Uh, speaking of coming around, how about we take a peek behind the curtain and see what's going down for our team? God. Okay, kids smoking. In the 50s, that was common. I love that Jerry O'Connell's the fat kid by 80s standards. I cannot stress it enough. This guy banged Mystique. Fat kid and Stand By Me grew up to bang Mystique, okay? Oh, that was from the review. The woman who doesn't know what a gunshot and a cherry bomb difference is. She does look like Big Bird. Maybe he had a point. God, living in a small town sucks. Yes, it does. And you guys don't know the half of it. You, hey, we do. Yeah, we do. No, no, no. You grew up in Piqua. The closest city to you was Dayton, which is like five seconds south. I grew up in liberal Kansas. Literally, the largest city was four hours away. Liberal was the large town. So people came to liberal because we were the big city. God, you sound like a Stephen King character. Dude, I remember one time we walked out into a uh, field. It was like before they planted anything after a long rain. field was flooded. So me and my buddies were like, oh, we want to go walk through that, thinking it would be really deep. But no, it was yeah. about ankle deep at its deepest. We got about yeah. halfway through it, and we're like, this was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and not a dead body to be found anywhere. That's... No, no. <laughs> Josh has the tragic backstory of the group. Honestly, they didn't start really, really, really frowning on that word until, like, recently, like 2010. That's always been really derogatory. Yeah, but it wasn't, oh, yeah. like, it wasn't cancel-worthy. Yeah. Well, let's be honest. A lot of things that were okay-ish in the 1950s are cancel-worthy now. Jesus Christ, the things we did before the internet. And that's one of the things that always bothered me as a kid watching movies about kids. Because all the kids are doing these things, running off on like days long adventures or whatever the have you without parents being there. Or a Halloween episode where they're going trick or treating and no parents. I had my parents four steps behind me growing up. And then I found out as an adult, yeah, I didn't live in the best neighborhood. They kind of had to. <laughs> yeah, back in uh, 1995, I won the uh, pancake eating contest for the junior division. There was a junior division. Good yeah. job, Lardass. <laughs> My picture was in the paper and everything. Josh's backstory gets more and more tragic with each telling. Yeah, it's going to be hell to get into the new 52 version of Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I relate so much to Jerry O'Connell's character. <laughs> God damn it. Fuck, it sucks to be 12 in a small town. Yes, it does. Yeah, I agree with Tom. I, I identify with Jerry O'Connell's character. Hey, it's Josh's little uh, pawn. <laughs> <laughs> they aren't like that in Kansas. Oh, that's disgusting. There's no telling how long that water has been there. Oh my oh. god, we sound like our parents. God damn it, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> like, this, like, if we were their age, we'd absolutely be splashing around in this water. But now that we're adults, we're like, oh god. Can you think of all the germs in there? Yeah. Oh, god. I hope none of them have an open cut. Yeah. You could lose that arm, young man. No kiss. <laughs> god. <laughs> I'm laughing because I had the same thought. <laughs> Just what is Goofy supposed to be anyways? Hmm. Well, if you have your own thoughts about the film we're watching, or Goofy and whether he is a dog or not, or about films we should watch, or just thoughts in general, feel free to email them at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Be sure to put fire pit in the subject line, as well as whether you're emailing a question, a comment, an ad request, a suggestion, or anything else, and we'll immediately forget about it, but only after we've read it. That email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Ugh. Either I stepped in a dead guy or it's time to get back to the film. Thank you all for joining and, as always, good luck. In my defense, I'm still friends with all the friends I knew when I was 12. Again, I wasn't friends Although, with you guys in grade I school. Did, I did have, <laughs> I, 
I was that age, I had a best friend named Dan Patel, and we hung out all the time. And now I I haven't spoken to him in 20 years. Hell, yeah. Kirk Stover. I, he was my first friend as a kid. Don't even know what happened to him. It's weird what time does, guys. It is yeah. weird. Yeah, because like I said, Dan Patel and I were inseparable. We rode our bikes all over the neighborhood, went out to the soccer fields, the Pittsburgh fields, and just walked around and hung out all the time. And like I said, I haven't spoken to him in 20 years. Yeah, we all need to be doing this in like Richard Dreyfus voices. Josh, you're better at voices. Do this in Richard Dreyfus voice. We need we need a narrator. Uh, uh, I need the cue here. Uh Okay. Um, we, we hung out every day. Now, Tom, last I heard, he he was stripping down the street. <laughs> <laughs> I heard he, he's not pulling in as much as he used to. Dan, he's turning tricks around the corner. I'm talking car tricks, not actual, you know, bumps. that's still Tom I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, Dan, he's, he's doing the car trick. He's terrible at it. And last I heard, he was uh, stabbed in the back. <laughs> trying to steal some guy's Josh, money. Josh, you're fired dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I miss Sorry. those guys. They uh we spent years together and we were inseparable, but now I just go pay Tom to give me lap dances and I stab Dan for stealing money from me. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, you're not allowed to do voices anymore. You're done. <laughs> Dan, I think oh. he's only mad because I made him a stripper. <laughs> A washed out stripper. Come on. So who wants to start before Josh writes an even darker backstory to our uh, Got into epilogue. a heroin addiction when he was in his early 40s. I'm not liking this epilogue at all. <laughs> then the wrong customer came a calling. I am editing him in this... the butt. He died instantly. <laughs> I'm editing all of this out. Dan served four years in prison for it, but ended up getting off on a misdemeanor charge. <laughs> <laughs> we need to stop letting Josh have lines. <laughs> we need a Josh bot. <laughs> I'm going to go before Josh comes up with something else. Well, so our story starts with Richard Dreyfus reminiscing, writing a story. And his story starts with him and his friends, young Will Wheaton, Corey Feldman... River Phoenix and Jerry O'Connor, Connell, that's the right name. They're all hanging out and such, and Jerry O'Connell lets them know that, hey, my brother found a dead body. You want to go check it out? So they decide, well, we don't have the internet yet, so might as well. So they go on a journey. They start going around. Turns out they forget to bring their supplies, but they bring a whole lot of baggage with them. Holy crap. Turns out Will Wheaton's character's brother, John Cusack, died in a terrible, tragic car wreck, and because it's the 1950s, his parents don't care. Corey Feldman nearly gets uh, hit by a train because he thinks he he's playing chicken with the train, because that's what you do in the 50s. They try to cut through a great, uh, graveyard, Jesus God, a junkyard. Uh, they almost get caught by a dog, but they uh, turns out Corey Feldman's dad's insane, and that drives him insane. Uh, they walk around a whole lot. It's basically Lord of the Rings condensed down to an hour and a half. There's walking and more walking, more dodging trains. There's a train scene on a bridge because Jerry O'Connell is my spirit animal in this. Uh, decides crawling is the best way to avoid a train, and, well, whoops. But they survive, and then they wind up in the woods. There's some heart-to-heart -heart between Will Wheaton and River Phoenix, because River Phoenix was done dirt by some teachers, blamed for stealing. There's a lot of crying, there's a lot of wondering what the hell Goofy is, whether he's a dog or a human. Meanwhile, Kiefer Sutherland and his cronies, uh, the cronies let Kiefer know, hey, by the way, we know where a dead body is. So they get in their cars and ride, they nearly kill a dude in a truck playing chicken with him but because it's 1950s no one notices they all wind up at the bodies the kids find them first Kiefer comes in he brings a knife but thankfully Ensign Wesley Crusher brought a gun so it became pretty much a gun to a knife fight situation everyone else bails on Will Wheaton and River Phoenix but those two stand their ground they get the body but they decide eh, we're not gonna love 200 pounds of corpse with us so they leave it behind. More catharsis. Uh, epilogue. It turns out at the beginning, River Phoenix's character, he had died in a stabbing, and that's what inspired Richard Dreyfus's character to write the story. And it ends with Richard Dreyfus lamenting that he never had.
had friends like he did when he was 12 years old. Even though for the majority of the story, his friends were kind of assholes and dicks. And he was probably better off without them. The end. So really, I'm going to start with a negative and go into the positive. I still don't quite relate to these kids or their story as much. Just because, well... This was nostalgia for those that were kids in the 50s. And obviously our nostalgia is a lot less corpse-centric than theirs. But for me, I still appreciate, especially after seeing many, many more nostalgia films or nostalgia-inspired stuff. Well, let's say um, Stranger Things, Sandlot. The kids just felt real. They weren't caricatures. I said it early on, there's a major difference between having character and being a character. And all these kids, they had character. Jerry O'Connell's character was obviously the play it safe, more wishy-washy one, but he wasn't excessive. Same with Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton's character was supposed to be the inevitable writer of the group, but he wasn't a geek. He wasn't overtly so. They all felt like people you probably knew when you were 12. I did relate a lot to Jerry O'Connell's character as much as I would have loved to have been the Joaquin Phoenix of this. Would, River or Phoenix. even the, What now? River, River, River Phoenix, Phoenix, thank you. Yes, that's right. Joaquin River Joaquin Phoenix. Brother, but no. <laughs> yeah, as much as I would love to have been the River Phoenix or even the Will Wheaton, um, I would have absolutely have been the Jerry O'Connell of the group. And I come by it honestly. I've got some more thoughts and notes, but I don't want to steal all the thunder. So, Nigel, I'll turn it to you next. Um, I'm kind of with you. I don't relate too much to the nostalgia of the movie because I didn't grow up in the 50s. So uh, this movie was definitely made for an audience that did grow up in the 50s and was nostalgic for it. But I do relate to Will Wheaton's character of the nostalgia of your childhood and how you do kind of think about things like i was friends with this guy but then he just became another face in the crowd and that is kind of weird like we do have friends and we, and you, we all three of us as the credits were rolling rattled off a couple of names of people that were thought man i'm in i was inseparable with that guy for a long time and now i haven't spoken to him in 10 15 20 years and and that's kind of weird when you think about it and even as adults we've had friends that at one point in time we couldn't imagine our lives without and then you think back on, you're like, I can't believe I was friends with that person. Not not that they're bad. Not that they became a bad person. That's why you're friends. It's just sometimes friends grow apart and they just yeah. hang out as often as they used to. So I, I do relate to that part of the movie. And I, I did like it. And um, I liked uh, some of the, the fantastical stories of the dog, and the, the sick balls, and all that stuff. Like we kind of had stories like that when I was a kid. I remember there was an empty house, like an empty old, old house down the street and another block. And we had convinced ourselves that there was a murder that happened in that house and that's why it was empty and you could seal you could still see the bodies if you looked at the in the windows and stuff like that like we just like kids just assume that they, even if there was a murder like that they never removed the bodies from that house they're still <laughs> in the house you know it's just the kind of the crazy shit that kids come up with in their own heads when they get in their own heads just the imagination of the children yeah like you know oh my god yeah, yeah there was a murder at that house that's why it's still empty that's why nobody lives there because the bodies are still in there <laughs> it's like as an adult you think think about that you're like that makes no sense that the bodies would still be in there if the house is in a very well lit well to do neighborhood <laughs> like you know I, I didn't grow up in a rundown section of detroit where they never go anymore you know <laughs> but then i i relate to that in the movie and that's why i really enjoyed this film is because i relate to the kids just having these adventures in their heads that end up being bigger than they are and that was what this movie is they're going to find this body and they're they're they got all these fantastical ideas about it and then when they finally see it it's like he's just a kid like us and he's dead oh my god <laughs> it's like so good so anyways i don't want to steal too many more thoughts uh in case josh has got something to say so i will kick it over to you josh it's okay dan you didn't step on any of my toes tom did all that already oh, okay um, <laughs> well you know considering the epilogue you gave me Shut up, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I was going to say was like, this movie got me nostalgic for nostalgic films like The Sandlot because I remember growing up with those movies. And yeah, I, it's like, I, I really enjoyed the movie. I felt the plot overall was very simple. But then again, it's like, uh, like Jaws, like I mentioned last week, 
the plot in Jaws is not very complicated. The plot in this movie isn't very complicated. It's just, it's very well done. I think sometimes I think a simple plot is necessary. You save your complex plots for books and video games. I think movies need a simple plot because I think that gives you a better opportunity to flesh out the characters. Like you're not rushing from scene to scene. You get a chance to sit down and watch these characters have a conversation and then you grow attached to them as you're watching it. Yeah. So, and like, I felt like we, at the beginning of this movie, it's like, okay, they were just a bunch of kids. And then at the end of the movie, they're like, these are characters that I'm attached to. And I just feel like, you know, it wasn't that complex of a story either. They literally were walking 90% of the movie. There's more walking in this than there is in uh, walking in the, there's a walking Phoenix joke there somewhere, but I can't find it. I'm, I'm sure if we walk far enough, yeah. we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. yeah, slowly. It'll take a couple days. But no, it's a, it was a really good movie. And I, honestly, I think one of the aspects that I really liked about it is the fact that it showed these boys show real emotion. Like, I think every single one of them was crying at some point. And it wasn't in a way that made them be... It wasn't a negative way that they showed it either. Or tragic ways. Well, not yeah. like someone died and that's why they are crying. It was emotional yeah. catharsis. Yeah, like one was because his dad was being made fun of, and he really respects his dad. The other one is because his brother died. The other one is because the teacher totally screwed him, and now he's the bad guy to the town. He just wants to be gone. I think we've Actually, all had that thought. He wasn't so much crying because his brother died. He was crying because he had these thoughts that he's the wrong brother died. You know what I mean? But it, overall, yeah. it was about that. But Or uh, the River Phoenix character, Chris, he was crying because, you know, he got screwed by a teacher when he tried to return the milk money because he knew it was wrong. And then he got blamed for it. And he just wanted to not be in that town. Like, I can relate to that so many times, you know. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. as you guys remember, I wasn't the most popular kid in grade school, middle school, and high school. Well, see, jo- Dan and I can't relate to that because we were absolutely the most popular kids in, yeah, in everyone... our, our Catholic school see, and then, you know, high that's school. That's why I was amazed you guys would even talk to me. Because I mean, I was, you guys were the top dogs. Everybody wanted to be you. Yeah, they did. all the guys wanted to be us, and all the girls wanted to do us. And yeah. some of the guys wanted to do us too. And, you know, yeah, we, we could. I was one but... of them. I was one of them. Yeah, because you were absolutely there. Yeah. And then Tom, when you started stripping at eighteen, oh my God, everybody <laughs> wanted to be you. And we're back to that shrubbery maze. <laughs> God damn it, Josh! Full circle. <laughs> this is going to be supposed hell to lean into it. You guys are terrible at improv. I don't want to listen to the improv where I start stripping at 18. <laughs> yeah, I'm not leaving. I'm tragic not leaving. death in your early 40s. Come right. on, that's like a 22-year uh, stripping career. You made bank. Come on, you at the height of it, you were making $5,000 a night. Needless to say, you were pulling tricks the most. But $5,000 a night, Tom, come on. I am not on board with this narrative. <laughs> that's, ch- that's that's a good chunk of change. I know, it night. really is, actually. I'm not going to lie. That doesn't sound too terrible. <laughs> but die in my early 40s. So about the movie. Yes. But no, I was saying, uh, Dan, you brought up the point that this movie was, the people watching this movie were in their 30s nostalgic yeah. about the 50s and because uh, this was in the 80s yeah so uh, this would have been more geared towards people born in the 50s but i mean think people who had been in their 40s or 50s watching this movie um mm-hmm. and being nostalgic about it so it's like uh what, what would be a coming of age movie was it would have the sandlot that was mid 90s wasn't it but that was about the 70s 60s that was about the 60s i thought one of the no they made them uh one of the uh epilogues for one of the characters that got really into the 80s and then no, no he got really talk. into the 60s was it the 60s? I thought it was the 80s. Yeah, I think he said he got really into the 60s. I don't know. It was around that era. God, we're getting to that age now. We're starting to make movies about kids. We are at that age. We're making movies about kids in the 80s. Yep. Stranger Things, dude. Yeah, Stranger, Stranger, Things. Stranger Things definitely is that. Yeah. And I wouldn't say it's as deep as Stand By Me is, but Stranger Things definitely leans into that 80s nostalgia. And the one thing I do appreciate about Stranger Things, and my cousin Scott brought this up, because my cousin Scott was a kid in the 80s. So was my cousin Steve. They were in their formative years in the 80s. In fact, my cousin Scott graduated high school in 1987. He said the thing that he likes about Stranger Things is that they treat the 80s realistically. Yeah. And that the characters don't all look like they're dressed to go to an 80s themed party. In fact, oh, yeah, watch- especially the houses, the interior of the houses. Because, mm-hmm. like, I was, uh, you guys are, like I said, only a few years older than me. I was freaking seven years old at the end of the 80s. So I remember the way houses were in the 80s. Yeah, and they were all wood paneling with like nasty carpet. That's because we grew up middle class, 
And a lot yeah. of our houses had a lot of seven late seventies yep. carpet decorated. and shit. Yeah. Because if you notice the difference in Stranger Things, Will's family, because his the, it, she's a single mom and she's not very rich and all that stuff, her house still kind of looks like it came out of the late seventies instead of the eighties because of how it's decorated. But then when the the rich kid in high school, when you see his house, they got all the cool eighties shit. That's one thing I do like about that is the interior. Like you said, the interiors of the houses definitely look like they did in the eighties. My cousin Scott said the the mall. He loved the mall in season. Yep. He said, because that looked just like this mall that opened up down the road from him when he was in high school. But we're not talking about Stranger Things tonight. We're talking about Stand By Me. So I want to get back into that. Um, Do you have anything else for my closing thoughts there, Dan? (laughs) (laughs) Damn, Josh is a dick today. (laughs) Trying to replace with bots, giving us death Wait a minute, what? How do you know that? I mean, I am not. I was trying to think of a movie that... (laughs) relate to that uh, coming of age movie that has flashbacks to either the late eighties or the mid nineties, which would have been where we spent our formative years. I can't. Interestingly enough, I was thinking about this. It. That's right. Because. Oh it, yeah. Yeah. The yeah, new the re- 17. It. Yeah. I don't know that they ever say a date in it, but the modern day components are our age. Well, a few years older, you know, they're in their late or thirties, forties. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they're around our age. I mean, uh, Bill Hader, he's what, in his mid 40s? Something like that. And McAvoy is a few years older than us. And so, like, their younger components is late 70s, early 80s. So, really, that kind of fits into the whole theme, you know? There's there's a lot of layers. That's true. I can see that, yeah. But uh, no, I, overall, I really, I really enjoyed this movie. And I remember bits and pieces of it now after I've watched it, <laughs> but I don't think I've ever seen it all the way through. But final thoughts is, in summary, it made me nostalgic for the nostalgia. I really enjoyed the movie, and it's what you can do with a relatively simple plot with deep characters. The directing, I think, helps that to that very Mm -hmm. realistic level, which is, if you compare this film to Reiner's other films, especially Spinal Tap and the Cusack film he did, which were very stylized. Well, Sure Thing was stylized. Obviously, this is Spinal Tap documentary, but this one, just the way he shot it, just kept it grounded. Like you were just running around with these guys. Like the train really was chasing you down those tracks and was going to get you at any time. Mm-hmm. They, they, they chose the right director for this film. Yeah, and that, that, that last scene, or one of the last scenes in the movie where he's pointing in the gun at Kiefer Sutherland's character. Mm-hmm. That's a very tense scene. That is. Oh, I was very tense, yeah. yeah. The casting in this movie was fantastic. And a lot of these, the, the actors, I know they went on to have good careers for the most part, but man, they knocked it out of the park. They just, they really, really, really did. And it kind of makes you appreciate a good child actor. Oh, yeah. It, because a bad one can just ruin a film. Also, I really like the writing. I love the way they wrote these kids in the movie. They didn't write them as tiny adults. They wrote them as kids. Like they, they, behaved, oh, yeah. they behaved and talked and acted the way kids of that age would act. Oh, yeah. They played with each other like kids 12-year-olds would. They talked to each other like 12-year-olds would. And they just, they had really interactions of 11 and 12 year olds. Like I remember farting around with my friends at that age. You guys remember. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We farted with you too. Yeah, duh. Yeah, yeah. You were very much a farter. Yes, I did. I still am. I still am. Ask my wife. The mother farter. But, uh, although I do want to point out one definitely standout performance in Kiefer Sutherland. Oh yes. my God. He is such an intimidating presence. Just even right? from the first scene, you're like, oh shit, calm down. I need to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Like you, you did not think he would stand down from a gun, considering he would not stand down from a truck. Yeah, no, it's damn. And his you know, first that's, role. That's an amazing parallel that you did. It's like they did that chicken scene to establish the next scene. So that told the us as the audience, it's like he's not going to stand down. He's going to run this head on. So when you know Wesley Crusher has the gun to his face, you're mm-hmm. like. We just saw this scene and he ran the guy down. What's going to happen? So I think knowing that about his character definitely added to that level of uh, intimidation Mm -hmm. that he was doing. It's like, you know that he's not afraid of running down a truck that's twice the size of him, his vehicle. Mm -hmm. He's not going to stand down from this gun. That's Mm -hmm. what made it so tense. Like, if they didn't have that scene, it wouldn't have had them as much weight as it actually did. I agree. I agree. If they ended in the chicken scene, it still would have been a good scene, but it wouldn't have had to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, especially when he brought out the knife. It's like, you just saw him with a truck. What's he going to do with this knife? He ain't afraid of nothing. And also, 
for my psych, I pointed this out too. Considering they were finding a kid that was killed by a train, they had a lot of close calls with a the train. They very nearly became that kid on multiple yeah. occasions. Kiefer thought that it wasn't the true antagonist. It was the train. <laughs> <laughs> That's the inevitable sequel to Stand By Me. The train finds them as an adult yeah. and hunts them down one by one. The train is actually the it monster from Derry. Yes, connected. Connected universes, y'all. Three ten to Castle Rock. Oh God! Oh God! Toot, it's so... toot motherfucker. <laughs> toot, yeah, toot, toot, motherfucker. Oh God! It's oh, God. canon now. It is. It's canon. It's been established. Coming two thousand twenty-one. A sequel no one asked for. <laughs> God, I don't want that to happen. <laughs> You know, now that we've said something, Hollywood's already got its gears a moving. Oh yeah. Matter of fact, I just got an email from a bot saying that that was a great idea. They want to pit. They want to buy the script from us. I'll turn tricks before I sell out to Hollywood. <laughs> I'll turn tricks before I sell out to Hollywood. Didn't well, you turn down that one acting role to can, for your stripper job? You're like, this money can't be as good. Stop writing my <laughs> epilogue. God damn it, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> he was stabbed in the one eternity later but it was in fact his own blood and even though i haven't spoken to him in 10 years i'll miss him i, I miss him yeah i cannot include any of this in the podcast <laughs> he died instantly <laughs> he died instantly so this has been the fire pit uh, we all think no one ever looked better in tidy whiteies or a banana hammock. <laughs> he was it a man of red hearts on it. Man of many talents. I want to try to thank you for joining us, but most of you have tuned out by now. <laughs> I know. I wish I could. None of this is making it in. But <laughs> no, it is oh, not. Oh, I trust in Tom's creativity. I think it will make it way in a very creative way. There's no way I can create of any of this. I'm just going to have to insert anything else but YouTube. Can I get a Dan bot and a Josh bot? See, the goal is eventually we don't even need to uh, record. We just, you know, it'll write itself, edit itself, and publish itself. We just rake in the money. It'll be easier to edit, that's for sure. Make me a stripper. Jesus, God. <laughs> As always, you can find us online at uh, podbean.com. That's firepit.podbean.com, podbean. For whatever reason, hasn't kicked us off their platform. Though I think after this episode, they're going to. Oh, my God. Uh, but you can also find us connected to Amazon, Google, iTunes. We have, as Nigel or Reginald noted Spotify. earlier, Spotify, as Reginald noted, um, on top of our email, we also have a Discord now, which you can connect to on the Podbean. So feel free to pop in. We like giving in shout outs to people that listen to us. Um, so yeah, join us on Discord. We'll try to find ways to you know, give everyone a little bit of a shout out, a little gratitude for everything you're giving us here, whether it's just your ears, your money, or both. Or word of mouth. Speaking of shout outs, I'll give a special shout out to Peggy, friend of the channel. Thanks again for listening. Really sorry about the long, long period of silence that'll come after Josh's final notes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain later. But <laughs> uh, what are we watching next week, guys? Aren't we? Uh... Oh, next week we are going to follow River Phoenix oh, to okay. the uh, 86, is it 86 smash hit or 85? I forget what year that is. But another movie, but it's not quite a coming of age and it's definitely a lot lighter than this film. Explorers, where a group of kids discover how to create a force field and make a spaceship from trash. I absolutely love this movie as a kid, and I really am glad I get to introduce Tom and Dan to it next week. Yeah, Hopefully, well, uh, my memories are as good as I remember. I, so this will be nostalgic for me, but it may be a train wreck for them. I do have fonder memories of a kid building spaceships out of trash than I do finding dead bodies by the railroad tracks. Yeah. So that's a nostalgia I can get behind too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that sounds awesome. Uh, sounds like a different movie that I've never seen before. I hope. I enjoy it. The last time we watched a movie that I hadn't seen yet, uh, I had an existential crisis staring up the whole thing. So, <laughs> I think oh. all of us did. 
yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And this one is not one none of us have seen. So we tend to have better chances when at least one of us is, you know, check the waters first. So I'm cautiously optimistic. That's true. That's true. But more kids in danger in the field trip to Kingtown. So this time from the vacuum of space. Well, it sounds a little safer than the 1950s. That's (laughs) sure. (laughs) <laughs> very true also special shout out to the sync lounge for letting us do all this technology is what's making this possible and sync, sync lounge is that technology despite the technical difficulties earlier on yeah sync lounge is fantastic uh, for those of you who don't know it allows us to sync our uh, plex libraries and view it all simultaneously like we're sitting together in the same room mm-hmm. but we're not we are actually in uh, three very different areas but we yeah. are which is why we're not beating the crap out of josh for his epilogues <laughs> <laughs> just you tom dan liked his yeah I mean, yeah, I kind of became a really, really bad street hustler, but, you know, I mean, can't win them all, I suppose. You put me on the spot. I'm going to go there. Just... <laughs> you really didn't have to, though, Josh. But until next time, I've been Tom. I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. <laughs>